in the A, B, and C year of the lectionary cycle, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we read the account of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Today, because it's the A year, we're working in Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So, all right, now stop. Before we begin, do context a little bit. What comes before this? Immediately, immediately preceding this story today is the story of Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. So he's baptized by John, then he goes to the wilderness for the temptation story. When this story is over, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, he goes to Capernaum and begins to assemble his, his 12 apostles. Then in Matthew 5, we have the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7. So the context is extremely important. This is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, okay? So, uh, why, would you, why would you be interested in this? As you're reading the Gospel of Matthew, first of all, you want to know who he is. Remember, the Gospel starts out, this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, three sets of 14 generations. You want to know who he is. You want to know uh, if, if he is going to be strong enough to stand up to what the world is going to throw to him. So the temptation of Christ story serves a very important function. Basically, the author, from a doing a, pretending you're reading a, a Greek or Roman story, he's the hero, Hercules, about to go on a great journey and engage in combat and a battle. So in other words, you need to know who Jesus is for the rest of the book. So this is a foundational story in the life of Christ. Now, why do we read this the first Sunday in Lent? Ash Wednesday was last week. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of our Lenten discipline. Lent has 40 days, 40 days. In this story, Jesus is tempted in the, after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. 40, the 40 number is very important. So the 40 days is why we read this today, the first Sunday in Lent. Anyway, that's enough background. Let's get into this. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Joan for reading. What story was she reading? You have to be able to count to three if you read the Bible. The creation, the fall, and the rest of the Bible is about redemption, right? The story that Joan read today is about the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And remember what happens. Satan, the serpent, appears to Eve and says, did God really say and what does Eve do? Eve tries to outthink and outreason the serpent, right? The two lies of the serpent are, you will be as gods, you will not die. Eve tries to argue with Satan, and how did it turn out? The fall. Adam and Eve fell in the garden in, back here in Genesis chapter 3. The second reading that Joan read is about Paul writing, and he's talking about the first Adam, Adam, who fell in the garden, and the second Adam is Jesus. Adam is the son of God, so is Jesus. So that's where the links come in. So let's go, let's, take, let's tackle this thing. First thing, when you read this story, ta -da, I charted it out for you. You have to be able to count to three today. It's like a pie chart. There are three great spheres of human activity. The economic sphere, the religious sphere, and the political theory, uh, sphere, three spheres, okay? Each of the temptations hits one of these three, okay? So the first one is economic, so let's go to work here. All right, now, the story begins, Jesus is led up, led up, right? What do you mean up? He's in the Jordan River that's way below sea level, and he's led up into the wilderness. The wilderness is up here, okay? And we think it's on the opposite side of the Jordan River. So what's out there? It's really wilderness. Think of like Arizona without the cactus or something. I mean, it's really a desolate area. He's led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Stop. Let's talk about the wilderness for a minute. The wilderness in the Bible is a mixed, mixed place. In the book of Exodus, Moses leads the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Remember, they've been there for 430 years. There's two and a half million uh, Hebrews, and they're led out of slavery into, into the wilderness. Now, what happens during, during that time? They live in the wilderness for 40 years. 
the entire slave generation has to dial off before they go into the cross the Jordan River under General Joshua and occupy the Promised Land. Where does this take place? Moses, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, is standing on Mount Nebo, and he has an opportunity to look at the Promised Land over here. He can't go into the Promised Land, but he gets one glimpse of the Promised Land before he died, and Moses, God buries him, and knows, no one knows where. It's a three-hour lecture on that one. Okay? So the wilderness is viewed as a horrible place. During that 40 years, what do they do? They get manna, right? They get quail, and there's a rock that follows them around that provides their drinking water. The book of Hebrews says that rock is Jesus, rock of ages, okay? So during the time, what do they do? They murmur and complain the whole time they're there. It's a time of testing and trial for the children of Israel. As the Old Testament speeds up, as we read on and on and on, the wilderness becomes romanticized. Oh, what a wonderful place. Remember when God was with us, the Shekinah glory of God in the tabernacle? Remember we camped around and God provided us manna and our shoes never wore out? They romanticized the past. Do we ever do that? Yeah, we live in Rhinebeck. People, people pay big money to come to Rhinebeck and walk up and down the streets and look at the Victorian houses and go, oh, it must have been wonderful to live here 120 years ago. Well, if you lived in Rhinebeck 120 years ago, you wouldn't be living in the big house. You'd be lucky to have a job as a servant or, you know, working on one of the river people's estates or something. So their past is not, not something we should romanticize about. It's something we should study and be aware of, but don't act like it was a wonderful place to be. Um, again, what is the ultimate, the ultimate economic statistic is average life expectancy. In 1900, the average male American died at age 48. Today, it's what, 74, 76 years old? What's better, to be dead or to be alive? Yeah, I'd rather be alive right now in 2020, okay? So we have a tendency to romanticize the past. Well, that's what they, that's what they did. They romanticized the wilderness experience. While they were going through it, they complained bitterly about it. Okay? So the wilderness is a place of testing. So when you read the story of Jesus, immediately you would say, oh, Jesus is being tested. He's a holy man. He's going out into the wilderness. Who goes into the wilderness? Nobody in their right mind at this time would go into the wilderness. Why is that? It's a place of danger. There's wild animals out there. Chibi toss, civilized people stay in the city where you belong. You don't go into the wilderness. There's no, they don't have police. The Romans don't patrol out there. It's a very risky, a dangerous place to be. So the fact that Jesus is in the wilderness alone, you would say, hmm, this is a strange and interesting story. What is he doing there? Well, it tells us. There, he is tempted by the devil. Now, stop. Does the Bible tell you everything you want to know? No, it tells you everything you need to know for salvation. Matthew, or Mark, or Luke for that matter, in their temptation accounts, they don't talk about the origin of evil. They don't talk about why would, why would Jesus be tempted, in the, they don't talk about the reason why he's being tempted, and they don't talk about the origin of evil, okay? Um, and who is he tempted by? The devil. Stop. Now, Joe Chappelle looks like a nice guy, doesn't he? Right? Does he care about the Holy Trinity? No, he doesn't. Does he care about the Bible? No, he doesn't. What is he? He has a morbid interest in the devil and Satan. That's his big thing. So every Bible study, he wants to know about the devil, right? So he's a Joshi pay, right? This is why we keep him around, right? Musicians, right? These people, right? So what does the Bible say about the devil, right? But not a whole lot, right? You have to read Isaiah chapter 7, verses 12, 13, and 14. And there's a section in there that talks about Lucifer, the light bearer, and it's the five I wills. I will be like the most high. I will be like God. And for his ego, 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 right? Ego is uh, I, ego. He's tossed out of heaven. He's thrown down to the earth. So the Bible doesn't, doesn't dwell. It doesn't have like one third of the book devoted to the exploits, of the origin of Satan or something. Joe is deeply disappointed in this. He was looking forward to this, right? Now... Satan is a very odd thing. If you talk to normal people walking down the street, I'm always interested in what do normal people believe, right? So they don't believe in God because they're secular. They're too sophisticated. But they do believe in Satan. 
It's a very strange thing. Well, what do you mean? Well, look at the movies that people watch. Look at the books that they read, right? We have a morbid interest in zombies, in, in vampires. We have a morbid interest in the Antichrist. We have a morbid interest in evil. And all. Well, but we don't believe in it, though. Isn't it an odd thing, right? They don't believe in God, and they, 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 they laugh at it. They don't believe in this, right? Now, does evil exist? Uh, just a little, right? I have had the privilege of doing a little bit of travel, right? And I've been to a couple places before that reminds me that evil does exist. One of the places is called the Zeppelin Plots. Yeah, in Nuremberg, we were there. I stood on the, the you watch the Hitler movies where Hitler stood up in front of the, the, the Nuremberg rallies with thousands of people out there? Stood right there. And you think, how is it possible for this guy who dropped out of high school, who couldn't get into art school, he, he got denied from getting into the art school in Vienna twice. He was a homeless bum for seven or eight years living on the streets of Vienna. How is it possible that this guy went on to be the Chancellor of Germany? Chancellor of Germany, you got that? I mean, people that have PhDs from German universities don't get to be the Chancellor of Germany. How did this guy get to be Chancellor of Germany? How is it that he was able to lead this entire nation astray? How is it he was possible to, to World War II, 50 million people are killed. 11 million people killed in the, in, in the death camp, 6 million Jews. How is it possible this guy did this, right? Well, I think you might want to say evil might have had something to do with it, yeah. right? He's inspired, empowered by Satan himself. Another place that I went, I went to Buchenwald, right? Walked around Buchenwald. Now, what does Buchenwald look like? It's seven miles north of Weimar. Weimar is where Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was from. He's the high point of German culture, right? He's a classical liberal. He's a philosopher. He's a scientist. He's a genius. Everybody loves Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. To understand Goethe, if you know anything about Nazis, National Socialism, he's the opposite, okay? So he believes all men are equal. He, he wants to unify Europe under peace and harmony. He's a beautiful man. Well. The Nazis put Buchenwald in Weimar to insult the Weimar Republic and to insult Goethe. In the middle of the death camp is a big stump, about this big round. What is it? It's called Goethe's Oak. That's where Goethe would go and take his girlfriends into the country and they would read poetry and drink wine and have enjoy high German culture. That stump is in the middle of Buchenwald. And what is this? It's a concentration camp. And you walk around, and you look out, they have a fence. You look out on the other side of the fence. It's beautiful. The hills are surrounded. There's beautiful hills. It looks sort of like the Catskills or something around there. It's a place where evil, right? Evil is on the earth. Does evil exist? Yeah, evil exists. Whether you admit it or not, evil exists. Okay? And then we can get into things like Mao and Stalin and all the atrocities that have been committed. It's driven by evil. Okay? So, yeah, Satan exists. Now, so what does Jesus do? He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Again, the number 40 is the number of trial and testing. Who else fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? Moses, before he went out on Mount Sinai. So did the prophet Elijah before he went up on Mount Horeb. Okay? So, remember the Mount of Transfiguration from last Sunday? I forgot already. Jesus is talking to who? Moses and Elijah. One of the themes of Matthew, he's the new Moses and he's the new Elijah, okay, rolled into one. So the number 40, you would go, hmm, who is this person? One of the reasons you want to read the Bible and come to church is so you know who Jesus is. Who is he? Well, he's like Moses and he's like Elijah and he's in the wilderness and it's a recapitulation of the history of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. There's something, what is it about this? You want to read more. So here we go. The tempter, Satan has many names, right? The tempter, the accuser, um, the adversary, the evil one, okay? So the tempter comes to Jesus and he says this. If, then, if, then, if you are the son of God, then command these stones to become bread. That if, then formula is used three times in the temptation, but guess what? We hear it again. We hear it again at the very end of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 40, 
the crowd standing at the foot of the cross, they mock Jesus as he's suffering on the cross. And they say, if you are the son of God, come down off the cross. Then we'll believe in you. If then. It, isn't that odd? The words of Satan in the wilderness are the same words from the crowd mocking Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. If then. If then. So let's parse this. If then, it's an economic temptation, isn't it? What is it? Turn these stones into bread. Turn these stones into bread. Now, Nancy, you've been to Israel, right? Do we have a lot of rocks around here? I don't know how you can be a farmer around here. It's very rocky here. In Israel, basically, it's a bunch of rocks like this with sand sort of in between. It's one of the rockiest places I've ever seen. Now, if you can take these rocks and turn it into bread, what would, what would, what would that mean for you? Well, that means you get to manipulate the economy. That means you'd be a very popular person, wouldn't it? You can take nothing of no value. You have a superabundance of rocks. You can make it into something useful like bread. You'd have a lot of followers. You'd be very high in the polls, wouldn't you? Okay? Now, turning stones into bread. Who, when a reader 2,000 years ago would have said, oh, you're talking about the Roman Empire here. How did the Roman emperors keep power? They knew that you rule by the consent of the government. You have to get the crowds on the street on your side. So you know what they did in Rome? Bread and circuses. That was their program. You give them free bread. All roads lead to Rome. They bought bread from places, wheat from places like Alexandria, Egypt, and they made it into bread, and they gave it out free to the mobs in the streets. And to keep their mind off of politics, because that's really the domain of elite people, they gave them entertainments like the gladiators and chariot races. So they're so caught up in the entertainment and so caught up in the free bread that they just let the world slip by. They're being deluded. Look over here, look over here, the shiny thing over here. Bread and circuses. Now, is this idea of turning stones into bread something that, again, it's just a, a boring old Bible idea that we don't care about? Well, let me see. I happen to have some, some things here that you might be interested in. In 1921 to 22, the Weimar Republic turned on the printing press. They turned stones into bread. And it's called the German hyperinflation. These are, these are, these are uh, uh, Reich's notes, right? What was it like? Here's what it was like. The, high, the inflation was like 10,000, 50,000% a year. You would be paid three or four times a day if you worked at your factory. And you'd be paid bundles of money. So the shift would start at 8 o'clock in the morning. You'd be paid maybe at 10 o'clock in the morning. And you'd take these bundles of money and throw them over the factory fence. And your kids would run out and buy bread with it because the value of the currency was depreciating at such a fast rate that if you didn't buy the bread at 10, the money is worth like a half of what it would be at noon and half again by the time it's five o'clock at the end of the shift. They had wheelbarrows full of, full of money, right? And that would be worth like a dollar, right? And what was the effect of this? It wiped out the middle class. Wiped out the middle class in Germany. Well, what does that mean? Well, when Hitler came along, he promised to rebuild the economy because they had destroyed the economy through hyperinflation. They printed money, stones out of bread, Okay? And then here's another one. Robert, I really like it. And because I like it so much, I want to give you this, this Zimbabwe dollar. <laughs> How much is it worth? $100 trillion. That's how much I love Robert. $100 trillion. <laughs> they, they, in Zimbabwe, they tried to turn stones into bread by printing money. And what happened? It blew up the economy. Right? Wiped out people's life savings, right? One hundred trillion dollars. How much is this worth? No. Actually, it has like a negative value. If you're caught with it, you have to pay somebody, right, to look at it, right? And it, it, it's so worthless. And in Venezuela, they just did the same thing. Their inflation rate was 10 million percent inflation rate. That was in uh, uh, 2019. Same Trying to turn stones into bread. Same thing, hung, they blew up hungry. They blew up the best. Have you read somewhere? Yeah. A cup of coffee, 5,000 for rinse. Yeah. No. This, 20,000 for rinse. Yeah. 
So turning stones into bread, it, it's not something that, you know, just, you know, and I'll, I'll stop here. I, I won't do like a three hour uh, lecture, but there's a thing out there called MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, right? How are you gonna pay for all the free stuff? We're just going to expand the quantity of money. We're gonna print money to pay for it all. In other words, stones to bread, it's, it's right out of the news right now. Got that? Okay, so what does Jesus say? Jesus then looks at him and he says, one man does not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What is that from? The book of Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. The book of Deuteronomy is Jesus' favorite book, judging by the amount of times he quotes it. And who else is a favorite book? The Pharisees and Sadducees quote the book of Deuteronomy during Jesus' day. Also, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've heard of them, and Qumran, the Essene sect, they quote the book of Deuteronomy all the time. If you only read one book out of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, read Deuteronomy, okay? Uh, it's an executive summary of the other four books, right? So Jesus, yeah, he quotes, he says, one man does not live by bread alone. Is that a true thing, right? Yeah, we spend our whole life trying to get money. Oh, we need money. Oh, if we had money, all of our problems are solved, right? What happens to all the stuff you accumulate? Well, when you die, your idiot relatives are going to take all your stuff, all the souvenir cups you got from the Bahamas and all the stuff you've accumulated, the little humble figures, in it, and they're going to sell it all on eBay, and they're going to keep the money, and they're not even going to think of you, right? All that stuff that you accumulated. Again, the old joke is, when you do a funeral, you don't see an armored car following the hearse. All that stuff that you spend all your time and energy trying, oh, we're obsessed about money, oh, yeah, money, money, money. Well, guess what? You don't live by bread alone. You live by every word, the word of God, the word of God. People that survive, people that thrive, people that know what it's all about, they believe in the word of God. The word of God, God will never let you down. Your money might come and go. Wow, that was a pretty interesting week in Wall Street, wasn't it? Five trillion dollars wiped out in one week. Yeah. yeah, it's a good thing I believe in Jesus, yeah. right? And it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Amazing stuff. Now notice, what does Jesus do? Unlike Eve, Eve tries to argue with Satan, tries to outthink him. What does Jesus do? He quotes scripture back in the face of Satan. What is the Bible? It's a sword, it's a shield. It's offense and defense. You need to know the Bible. You need to learn the Bible. The more you know about the Bible, the better off you'll be in life. Right? This is the book that God gave us to get out of this mess, to help understand what's going on. Right? So Jesus then, he, unlike the first Adam, son of God, Adam failed the test. Jesus, however, cha-ching, strike one for Satan. Okay? Now, the second pitch, let's look at this. Then the devil took Jesus to, a whole, to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and put him on the pinnacle of the temple. Again, Nancy, you've seen this at the Temple Mount. It's right at the corner up there. It's like maybe as tall as our church steeple. So Jesus is standing up there on the roof of the temple. Now, what is that all about? If you read the Talmud, it says that the Messiah will make himself known standing on the roof or this, the high point of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? So in other words, Jesus, go here, stand up in the temple. And what do you do? If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down. Right? If, then. And, it, and what does Satan do then? Put a little, to sweeten the deal, he quotes the scripture. Psalm 91. He says, it, he says, he will command his angels concerning you that, that their, their hands will not, will bury, the angels will bury you up and you, you, your feet will not dash a single stone. Right? So, what does Satan do? Satan believes in God. Satan knows that God exists. He doesn't want you to know God exists, but he believes in God. He also knows the Bible. What do you mean Satan knows the Bible? Satan knows the Bible, and he knows how to manipulate it and twist it. Satan is a murderer, a slanderer, an accuser, and he's a liar, a scripture twister. God gave you a brain, right? Don't believe everything you see on TV. Don't believe everything you read on Facebook. You want to like check things out. Use your head. Read the Bible and know the Bible, right?
right? Because people will, they, 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 they manipulate the scripture, they manipulate the news, they manipulate things to try to get you to be their servant. The more you think on your own, the more you think things through, the more you pray about it, the more you stay centered, the more powerful you're going to be, the more you understand about how the world, how the world really functions, right? So be careful about people that come around quoting the Bible in your face, right? The scripture has been abused through the centuries, and of course Satan himself is the ultimate scripture twister. So what did Jesus say then? Jesus said, do not put the, you, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is a quote from Deuteronomy, again, chapter 6, verse 16. In other words, what do you mean don't, don't put the God, name of the God? It's like, if there's really a God, I'm going to go to the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge and jump into the river. And if God really loves me, and if there really is a God, he will save me. Are you supposed to do that? No, that's putting the Lord your God to test, right? No, you don't do that. God gave you a brain, use your head. Okay, see how that works? Okay. Um, so, and again, it, this is the religious temptation. Imagine if the leaping Lord would have jumped off the pinnacle. What would that been? A lot of people would have been very impressed by this. You know, at 2.30 this afternoon, Billy Graham's going to swan dive off the top of the St. <laughs> Patrick's Cathedral, have a big crowd, put it on pay-per-view. And if he lived through the jump, then it'll be, send your tax-deductible contribution to Pasadena, California today. <laughs> a lot of people fall for this stuff, you know, signs and wonders and, you know, fake, fake miracles and so on. Be very, very caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Very, be very skeptical about this. So Satan wants to turn Jesus into some kind of a religious performer, working for Satan, not working for God. So again, Jesus quotes scripture in his face and he says, no. The third temptation is what? The political temptation. Ooh, the three great spheres of human activity. What is this one about? The devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain. Stop. A high mountain. Do we know about mountains from reading the Bible? Yeah, you do. Right? Mount Sinai, Moses gets the Ten Commandments. Mount Horab, the prophet Elijah goes. The Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Golgotha is a mountain. Mount Zion in the temple. Whenever you read about mountaintops in the Bible or comparative religion in general, remember the gods are up there? Okay? So Satan takes him to a high mountain. What mountain? It doesn't say what mountain. It's all mountains. And what does Satan do? In a moment of time, he shows them all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Is this a sweet deal? Yeah. You'd sell your soul for a $10 gift certificate at Walmart. Not even that. Dollar General. That's what you would do. <laughs> all the kingdoms of the world. I, I did a, a Google search this morning in my, in my research for this thing, and I said, how many empires have there been in, hu in human existence? It goes on and on for pages and pages and pages. Things like the Mongol Empire, you think about them? In 1297, it's the largest land empire in the history of the human race. All the land from Korea all the way over to the middle of Europe, wow. right? Or how about the Roman Empire? They had a pretty good run, didn't they? For Bible readers, New Testament, the Roman Empire is the dominant empire of the time of Jesus. They had a pretty good run. How about the British Empire? In 1913, 1914, before World War One, they controlled 25% of the world population. 25% of the world population, subject to the, of England. How about Napoleon? He had a pretty good run. He conquered all the land mass in, in, uh, in Europe, all the way up to Moscow. How about Hitler? He, he controlled a lot of territory too, didn't he? Right? So when the Satan says, all the kingdoms of the world and your glory, they'll be yours. Isn't that rather amazing? Again, politics is, a, is, a, is an amazing temptation. Satan wants Jesus to fall down and worship him. If you're the son of God, you know, fall down and worship me. I'll give you all this stuff, all the kings of the world. Now stop. What do we know about Satan? He's a liar. Okay? Does Satan control all the kingdoms of the world? He thinks he does. 
Remember, perception is the reality in politics? He thinks he does. No, he doesn't control the kings of the world. Satan, who is Satan? Creator, God, creation is Satan. Satan is a created being. He's limited in his power. Okay? Satan's a created being. He's not the boss of all human, all uh, human empires that have ever existed. Right? So in other words, he's giving away something that is not his to give. You know, the old joke about um, the Dutch bought Manhattan for $25 worth of beads, you know, from the Canarsie Indians or something? Well, what the joke is, that wasn't the land that belonged to the Canarsie Indians, it belonged to the Lenny Lenape people. So it's like, yeah, okay, go ahead, we'll sell you the land, 25 bucks, <laughs> right? So the Canarsie Indians thought it was pretty funny. Well, that's what Satan is doing here. He's trying to offer something that he doesn't control, because he's a liar, right? So what does, what does Jesus say? All you have to do is fall down and worship Satan, right? And Jesus says, away with you, Satan. Uh, have we heard this before? Yeah, get behind me, Satan. Matthew chapter 16, you want to read, read this section? Jesus is up at Caesarea Philippi, which way up north. And he says to Peter and the other disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, that's impressive. How did you know this? The Spirit must have revealed this to you. Then he says, okay, now that you know who I am, let me tell you something. I must go to where? The holy city of Jerusalem. What am I going to do there? I'm not going to lead a revolution. It's not going to be like, let's storm and kick out the rope. No, I must be betrayed. I must be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. There, I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again from the dead. In other words, that's the will of the Father that Jesus goes to Jerusalem, not to start a political movement, reform the economy, stones to bread, not to start a new religion. No, he's the suffering servant, not the political military messiah. It's not about politics, right? But Satan is trying to redefine the terms of the, of the great controversy. He's trying to make it sound like politics is, is politics you would think by watching all the ads on TV that your biggest problem is politics. All you need is to get rid of this guy and place it with the other guy. Well, guess what? If you get rid of one guy and place it with the other, your problems are you're still you're stuck with you, right? You're still a miserable individual. You have to deal with you, right? Again, re remove the log from your eye before you go around trying to get the speck out of other people's eye. No, look over here. Politics, that's what you need. It's amazing, right? So again, politics is not the solution. Right? And the high mount. So Jesus says, uh, away with you, Satan. Again, what does Jesus say to Peter when Peter says, oh no, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to make sure that you're safe. Safe and cozy. He says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Satan. You got that? Why is that an important story? Because the temptations of Jesus isn't just here. It isn't just, oh, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, he had the three temptations, the economic, the religious, and the political. Now, he lived happily ever after. No. Now it gets really tough. Now the temptation is going to be not really direct, it's going to be subtle. Remember, Satan is subtle, the serpent is subtle. Okay? It's not going to be, here's all the kingdoms of the world. It's yours for the taking, just worship me. No, it's going to be your best friend. Your bud, your companion is the one who says, oh no, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. Satan is trying to keep Christ off of the cross, away from going to Jerusalem to die on the cross for our sins. And he uses who? Peter, to prevent him from doing that. The temptations of Christ aren't just here. It goes on and all the way, all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, our picture back here. The temptations of Christ. Again, so don't limit it to just this event, right? And, and so Jesus says, again, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 13. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, 13 is a variation of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods. Remember, what do we do? We worship the creator, never the creation. Satan is a created being. He wants you to worship anything and anyone but the one true God, okay? So Jesus says, no, we worship God alone, that's it, okay? 
Now, the story ends this way in chapter 11. Then the devil, the tempter, the accuser, the liar, the slanderer, the murderer, he leaves him. And suddenly angels came and they ministered unto him. Again, next time we're going to see ministering angels with Jesus, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And beads of sweat turn into blood and the angels are ministering to him. They're with him in the Garden of Gethsemane during the temptation there. He could have just gotten up and said, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to die on the cross. Instead, he perfectly fulfills the will of the Father. The first Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. The second Adam is faithful. Faithful even unto death on the cross. That's why he is worthy to be our Messiah. He's 100% God and 100% man who was hungry, who was tested, who was tried. And he is one greater than Satan. He's the greatest one. And ultimately, what happens? The end of the Gospel of Matthew, right, is Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. It's the risen Lord appears on the Mount of Olives, and the Great Commission is Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The verse before that says this. Jesus says, all power is given unto me. All power in heaven and to earth. So in other words, Jesus is faithful. He does what the Father wants him to do. And as a result, we call him the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. It's not a title that Satan gave him. It comes from God. You see the difference? So Jesus stands up to the temptation and it goes through his entire life. And the risen Lord is vindicated and as a result, all power in heaven and earth is given to him. King of kings, Lord of lords. That's a couple thoughts on the temptation of Christ. Amen.